Join in the sound of heaven from every mountain top to every wild ocean. Oh, hear all the universe sing praise. Sing praise. Let everything that breathes, let all the earth proclaim. Great is Good morning, friends. Welcome to The Wall. My name is Ryan Gear. I'm the pastor here. If you're new with us, you're our guest, and we're glad you're here. And if you'd like to let us know, just text the word WELCOME to 480-530-7234. It'll text you back with a digital connect card, and just tell us about yourself, and uh, you'll get more info about The Well. If you don't get my weekly email, you can go to our website, wellchurch.org, and just scroll to the bottom of the page, and there's a, a place there where you can sign up for my weekly email that I send out every Friday and get the latest about what's happening at the well. So thanks for being with us today. And it's hard to believe it's here. Next Sunday is our return to in-person and online services 
at the well. So we've been almost online exclusively since March of 2020 when the COVID lockdown began. And so this is a big, uh, big week for us. And um, uh, to help us uh, celebrate this big week, we're going to be welcoming a special guest, uh, Aaron Stritzel, whom you've seen uh, give sermons occasionally here. Many of you know Aaron and love him and appreciate him. And Aaron is going to be joining us live in Chandler at Hancock Elementary next Sunday, July 18th at 10 a.m. If you're joining us online, uh, you can catch us at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Arizona. Uh, Arizona is also in Pacific time right now, and it's 10 a.m. And uh, Aaron is going to be giving the sermon live in Chandler. And um, we invite you, whether you're coming in person or online, to join us for a big week uh, this coming Sunday, July 18th. Now, if you're joining us in person, for fully vaccinated adults, a mask is not required, but we do encourage it. The vaccine does not give 100% protection against COVID. And for anybody who is not fully vaccinated, including children, masks are required. And we'll have Well Kids offered for pre-K through fifth grade. And we're going to have a great time together. Uh, and whether you feel comfortable joining us in person or online, we're going to celebrate together uh, next week. If you join us online, we're going to migrate to Facebook only. So Facebook only starting next week. I know some of us have strong feelings about Facebook. I probably agree with you. Um, but the reason we're doing this is we just want to uh, join together in one place. We don't want to further fragment our online service. So we want to join together in one place. And it's easier to share. If you want to share the service afterwards with friends, you can do that. And uh, so it's our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Well Church AZ is where you can catch the online service every week starting next Sunday, uh, July 18th. So we're super excited and then also uh, excited about our guests the week after. On July 25th, we're going to welcome special guest Amy Price. Amy is an ordained pastor in the United Methodist Church in Ohio, and uh, she's going to wrap up the Ten Commandments series uh, on July 25th, talking about you shall not covet. And um, I'm excited for you to hear from Amy. Amy and I graduated from the same seminary, and uh, she's a, a great person, a great speaker and leader, and you're going to appreciate hearing from her on July 25th. So today, we're continuing our series in the Ten Commandments, and Jezekiel Vitalzi is going to uh, talk with us about the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. And so we're going to watch Ezekiel's message, and then next week we'll see you either in person or online at our Facebook page uh, for the return to in-person and online worship. So now let's watch Ezekiel Vitalzi, You Shall Not Steal. Good morning, church. Welcome to The Well. My name is Ezekiel Vitalzi, and I'm one of the leaders here. And if you're new with us, you're our guest, and we're glad that you're here. Please let us know that you're here by texting WELCOME to 480 480- Five three zero seven two three four, and you'll get more information about the Well VR email, as well as you know, connecting you to our various social media pages, so that you can follow all the exciting things that we're up to. If you are a member here, hey, what's up? Good to see you. We love you. Um, we're excited that we are. We're coming back. We're coming back in person next week. Ah, oh, man, I cannot wait. I plan. I plan to be there in person, in the flesh, in the room with all of you fine people. In fact, I think we should all try to maybe invite a friend or two and make it like our most well-attended service today. It would be really cool if like the first in-person service that we have, you know, after, gosh, like a year and change of doing this all online, it could be, it would be really cool. And I'm sure that, you know, the band is going to really appreciate it. I'm sure Ryan will really appreciate it. Um, and it's going to be an exciting service. So we hope that you're going to be there. It'll be a really good time. And honestly, what are your friends doing even right now? Probably nothing. I think if, if, if your friends were ever going to come to church, <laughs> you know, this is the time because I feel like they're just so starved for any kind of friendship, any kind of activity that just allows them to mix it up with some other people. So let's make it happen. Hugs and high fives for everyone, unless you're not vaccinated. Anyway, uh, we're continuing our series on the Ten Commandments, as you know, and this week we're talking about commandment number eight, you shall not steal. And as we said in past weeks, the Ten Commandments, they were a way for God's people to start a new kind of tribe, one that was liberated from the evil strongholds that plagued the world. And let me just say, stealing 
is a very, very strong stronghold um, that can be very hard to overcome. And I say this because I know from personal experience, uh, man, you know, when uh, Pastor Ryan asked Pastor Aaron and me to preach on, on three commandments of our choice, I knew that I had to choose the eighth commandment. I didn't want to at first, but I, I knew that I had to. And the reason why, and you know, let me just say, most people don't know this about me. You know, most of my friends don't know this. Um, only like a handful of my immediate family knows this. But stealing used to be actually a really big problem in my life. In fact, I was once arrested for stealing. Um, when I was in college, I uh, stealing was a really weird habit for me. Um, you know, it was it was a way for me to to feed myself when I didn't have any money. It was a way for me to kind of uh, you know get school supplies that you know from the local Walmart when I didn't have really money for that. And really, honestly, I had some money for it, um, but I wanted to use that on fun things. So I was I was constantly stealing. I was constantly sneaking into the dining hall. I was constantly going to like the uh, the local you know, markets and the local, uh, the local, like, you know, uh, a la carte dining halls and just stealing food left and right. And one day I was, um, it was a summer after I graduated and I, you know, looked at my, in my pantry and I realized, oh, I'm, I'm out of groceries and, you know, I could spend like the $50 I had in my bank account on groceries. But I was like, no, I want to spend that on like, you know, going to the movies or, you know, buying beer, you know, something like that, you know, things college students do. Um, only I was in college, I had graduated at the time. And so I go to one of the grocery stores in the area and um, I start just like, you know, walking around casually. I, I kind of had the routine down and I, you know, I would, uh, I, I, I bought one thing and I put that one thing in a plastic bag and then I just kind of started walking around. And as I was walking around, I was kind of placing small things into the bag. Um, that way, as I walked out, it would just look like I have a grocery bag full of groceries when really I didn't pay for all of it. And as I was walking out, immediately two security guards rush at me. They grab me. They, they uh, you know, say some, some pretty aggressive things to me. Everyone in the store can see me. They see that I am clearly being apprehended. And they kept me in an office for hours until the police came. And the police arrested me. They, um, they gave me a court date, and uh, when all was said and done, I was uh, put on probation for a year. By the end of it, I w everything was expunged. I, you know, I did, I did you know, my time, I did some community service as well. Um, I really appealed to the judge, and uh, yeah, it was, it was the toughest, <laughs> toughest time of my life, you know, I had to, uh, be under lock and key for a while at my house. I couldn't drink. Um, I had to submit to voluntary or involuntary uh, drug testing like at any moment. Um, there was, it was just a really, really strange dark time and it was filled with shame. And, you know, after that super traumatic experience, um, I made a promise to myself to not only refrain from stealing, but to trust God, you know, in times where it felt like I needed to steal, in times where it felt like I didn't have enough. And from that day, even when times got tough, even when I knew I could get away with it, I told myself, you're better than this. You don't need to steal anything. You just need to trust God. And obviously it was a little bit more messy than that. It's not as if like I just turned the, uh, you turned a new, over a new leaf after that traumatic experience. Um, it was, it was a long journey to really kind of turn away from that lifestyle that I'd been doing honestly for years at that point. But I, but I, I will say that after, you know, so many years of really, you know, trusting God, that liberated me. It did. It made me more at peace with myself. And, you know, I've never felt freedom like that before. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today, 
I know that refraining from stealing seems like it's a very obvious, simple concept, and I'm sure a lot of you might even think, oh, Jezekiel, you know, that was cool, or not cool, that was something that you probably struggled with. I don't particularly struggle with shoplifting or, 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 or stealing stuff, but I honestly think you might be surprised. You know, I, I do think that there is something, um, you know, fundamentally speaking about the Eighth Commandment that I think anyone can 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 learn from. And there's a lot to consider when it comes to stealing. You know, stealing isn't just about taking things that aren't yours. It's about your heart. It's about greed. It's about justice. It's about the human heart's struggle to be content with what we already have and to trust that God will provide all that we need. Today isn't going to be, you know, a uh, uh, how do we not shoplift kind of sermon. Today, you know, the goal is to just have an honest conversation about the Eighth Commandment and to really see it for what it is. And I think it's important to ask ourselves three questions. First, I think we should have an honest conversation and ask ourselves, why do people steal? The second thing I think we should ask is, what is the Bible really telling us about stealing? What is it really telling us with the, with the Eighth Commandment? It can't just be like, don't steal and that's the end. I think that there's more. I think that there's something uh, under the surface there. I think that, uh, you know, it's not just about, you know, refraining from an act, which by the way, is uh, easier said than done. And then the third and final thing we'll, we'll ask ourselves is, you know, how does following the Eighth Commandment or perhaps just meditating on the Eighth Commandment um, a way for God to liberate us as people. I think if we can answer those three questions together, we can arrive at a really healthy place with this, and I think God will illuminate something for us today. All right, so let's dive in, you know. Let's ask the first question that I pose. Why do people steal? I think that's a good question, honestly, and uh, to really kick things off. And if you're watching right now, um, you know, you're watching this live uh, with our live stream, feel free to type in the chat your opinion on this. I really want to know, why do you think people steal? When I asked myself this question um, as I was preparing this sermon, um, this is what I thought before I did any research. This is what I thought, you know, and as I reflected on my life, my first instinct as to why, you know, people steal and why I fell into, you know, the patterns of stealing. The first thing I thought of was, well, you know, I can't, I grew up in a household where money was just really tight all the time, you know, and as a kid, I would often ask my parents when we were checking out of the grocery line, hey, can I have a candy bar, please? And they would always say something like, no, we can't afford it, or no, there's no money for that. And I get what my parents were really trying to say. As a 33-year-old, I get what they were actually trying to say. They were just saying, no, man, like, you know, we, 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 we just bought food. We don't, there's no space for that. And it's, and it's bad for you. But as, you know, a little kid, that's not really how I saw it. That's not really what I internalized. You know, I felt as if they were telling me, hey, we're poor. And therefore, we can't have anything fun. And so I you know, thought, okay, well, maybe that's perhaps why I struggled with stealing earlier on in my life, you know. Um, but again, let me let me just say, this was just my initial hunch about the topic of stealing, and it was not at all rooted in anything other than anecdotal evidence. Um, also, before I continue, and I know this probably goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways, because I want to be clear about something. I don't want you to hear what I just said and think, oh, is Jezekiel making the rhetorical point that being poor causes you to steal? Spoiler alert! No, I am not. <laughs> there are plenty of impoverished people in the world who don't feel the need to steal anything. And on the flip side, there are plenty of wealthy folks who do. So I don't think that what's in your bank account correlates necessarily to why people steal. Additionally, I'm going to avoid making any points about those out there who might have some kind of diagnosed mental disorder like kleptomania or the like. That, um, which is linked to, you know, stealing. Or perhaps, you know, I'm not even going to really talk about those who steal in desperation to feed their families uh, you know, or resort to, uh, to stealing as a means of survival. Those types of, uh, of, of things are probably best left to the experts and professionals um, who are, who are uh, qualified to speak about them. Um, and I don't think anyone here should really be making any judgments um, <laughs> uh, or aspersions about those people. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's our place. And I don't really think it's 
there's anything really productive that I can say about those those folks. Uh, this sermon is really aimed at the everyday phenomenon of stealing from seemingly honest folks who don't have mental health conditions or dire circumstances in life. I think it's important that I am clear about that. And with that being said, I think here's my actual point, and it's somewhat rooted in science, especially, uh, you know, in psychology. Stealing helps people feel what they want to feel. I'm going to say that one more time. Stealing helps people feel what they want to feel. And that tracks with my experience. You know, one could argue that when I was stealing, I was chasing the feeling that I could have fun things that I couldn't afford as a kid. Or perhaps I was chasing the feeling that if I wanted something, I could just have it. You know, and then money wasn't really a problem. Um, on top of probably many, many more complex feelings, uh, I think that stealing, in a lot of ways for me, gave me a psychological relief of some kind. And that's, you know, kind of what is the context for my life. And basic psychology supports this idea. Stealing, whether it, it be, you know, a poor kid shoplifting candy, or a Wall Street billionaire committing bank fraud, or a team of thieves trying to heist precious jewels from a secure location like we see in the movies, all of these things can be associated with people chasing a specific feeling, or a psychological benefit or reconciling something from their past. And for some, it, it's as simple, uh, like me, it's as simple as like uh, feeling something, feeling a way of, uh, you know, having something that they didn't have, um, or perhaps they've lost something and stealing is a way of feeling like they've gotten it back. Um, perhaps, you know, uh, others do it for the thrill of getting away with a crime. Um, or perhaps, you know, uh, you know, for, for the Bernie Madoffs of the world, some just have an unquestioning, un, you know, quenching thirst uh, for more capital. Honestly, the explanations are endless. Uh, as I've done my research, stealing is a very complex topic. Um, a, few, a few fun facts about it. Or I don't know about, the, about, the, about them being fun, but a few facts about it. You know, Dr. Robert Tominsky, he's a psychiatrist and the author of the book, The Psychology of Theft and Loss. He makes the case that we don't steal based on need. At least, you know, like seemingly honest people. Perhaps there are some, but the vast majority of folks, they don't steal based on need. But to subconsciously reconcile something that they lost in the past. You know, there's a pathology related to that. Additionally, another doctor, Dr. Wilk Kupchik, who um, is a psychologist, he wrote the book, Why Usually Honest People Shoplift, which if you haven't read it, um, I highly recommend it. I read the first few chapters online. He says that um, peop, honest, usually honest people act out by spewing in response to having their unconscious or subconscious minds stirred by some external events or circumstances. Which I think that that you know it, it, that tracks well, as, uh, and, and and gives you a little bit of insight about why people may struggle with it. Another really interesting fact, um, and this was a study done at Carnegie Mellon, and it concluded that people are more likely to steal if they feel psychologically removed from the act of stealing. And what they did was they um, they put a, uh, they, they they went to all of these common areas on campus with a fridge, and they stocked them just full of. Of, of, of Coke cans, Coca-Cola cans, that is. And as they kind of, you know, uh, monitored them over the course of the experiment, they noticed that, you know, different people were stealing the Coke cans. No surprise there, right? But here's, here's the control group. What they also noticed is that um, when they took away all the Coke cans and replaced them with dollar bills, like they put actual dollar bills in the refrigerator on a plate, and they just left it there, they noticed that those were stolen far less because to people that felt like stealing, but the Coke cans did not. They were once removed. And I think that that is the everyday experience of why a lot of people do the small stealing things, you know? You know, how often do we steal a pencil at work? Or how often are we at a hotel and we're just like, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and take some of this stuff. Like, people do that all the time. 
And stealing, you know, as, as you really think about it, it's so rooted in humanity. It is such a complex idea from a psychological standpoint. And what is also seemingly consistent in all of my research on this topic is the common theme that ties all of this together, which is that it all revolves around some kind of pathology. Um, basically, stealing offers the human spirit an unhealthy connection or attachment to an idea or belief that must be reconciled, like an itch that must be scratched. And this idea or belief is often a distorted form of the truth, which is why people are able to rationalize the behavior. Something else is that it's rooted in your life experience. You know, the, this pathology that, you know, convinces you that it's okay to steal, it is rooted in your past, which makes it so hard to reject because it's so personal to you. Do you see why God might want to liberate us from this? Do you see why uh, stealing comes from a place of disruption and brokenness? And that's not what God wants for us. God wants us to live with peace and restoration. So now let's ask ourselves another question. What do the scriptures have to say about stealing? And you know, honestly, the scriptures have a lot to say about it. And it's not even just in Exodus with the Ten Commandments, but Throughout both the Old and New Testament, stealing is referenced in the Bible more than 50 times. Which makes sense, you know, stealing will always be a core problem that humanity struggles with. This was true in antiquity, <laughs> it's just as true now. I mean, how often over the course of history have we seen empires fall because of greed? How many atrocities have been committed in the name of colonizing stolen land? How often, how often, be honest, have we seen leaders, especially religious leaders, fall because of embezzlement or dishonesty with funds? If you want a modern day example, which I'm not sure why you would need one, but should you, look at the company Enron, who knowingly stole from their employees for years and the fallout that came from it was just pure brokenness for all the people involved. Clearly, stealing is a watershed foundational concept that needs to be addressed on both the macro and micro level. You know, we, we know that society thrives when people do right by each other. The individual thrives when he or she puts in the work to sanctify their heart. If God's goal for the Ten Commandments in Exodus was, in Exodus was to liberate the human spirit and create a tribe that would be set apart from the pitfalls of the world, stealing had to be addressed. Moses wanted a tribe in which its people would respect the property of others, respect the justice of others, and live their lives with a liberated heart. This sends the message to the world that as Christians, we don't have to steal what we want. We are above this as a people. We are content with what we're given, and we have full faith that the Lord will take care of us. It, it is no mistake that Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And this narrative is seen throughout the Old Testament. You know, we see this decree of, st of don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. It is like echoed through Leviticus and through Deuteronomy and sometimes even threatening death for those who commit a violation of the Eighth Commandment. Additionally, in Proverbs and Isaiah, I, I picked two verses uh, that give us a little bit of context for the why behind this commandment. Um, I love uh, uh, the, the verse in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 10, verse 2. It states this, Treasures gained by wicked, wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. This verse speaks to the sanctification of the human heart. You know, by rejecting stealing and embracing righteousness, we are delivered from death, a.k.a. we gain eternal life. We um, live a life that is pure, that is full, that is at peace, that is restored. That is the fruits of acknowledging and observing the Eighth Commandment. Additionally, I love this other verse in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8, and it states, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. 
you know, the Lord loves justice. He loves, you know, people doing right by each other. And even when we do right, but people still do wrong to us, the Lord promises us that he will restore us. And that is a covenant that he has made with, with, the, with his people. And in the New Testament, we see these narratives continue with Jesus, reiterating the, the, the Eighth Commandment on multiple occasions. And we even see the Apostle Paul expounding on the Eighth Commandment in his letters to his church. We see it first in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Where, where the Apostle Paul writes, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And one can make the argument that this is a verse about salvation, and that might be true. Uh, but something else that is also true is that to inherit the kingdom of God means living a life, like I said, that is rich, full, and at peace. And when the Apostle Paul says that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God, he's essentially saying that people who are caught up in, in greed, in thievery, in drunkenness, they will live in a personal hell. They will live in, 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 in a life in which they will experience the stresses, the anxieties, the, the evil sorts of forces in the world that... Uh, will, 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 that create a stronghold in your life because you are a slave to these things. And I and I have I've been there. I I know what that personal hell is like to be constantly stressing about money, to be constantly stressed that someone's going to steal things from you, to uh to 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 go out into a shopping center and and be so stressed out to the point where you're just like I you know what I'm just going to steal these things because it's just easier than either refraining from buying them or saving up the money to purchase them. I know what kind of hell that is like. Additionally, in Ephesians chapter 4, um, verse 28, the Apostle Paul writes, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. This verse really spoke to me um, because it's about redemption, you know, of someone who steals. When we repent of our sins, and embrace the fruits of labor, that that restores us, you know, and 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 we restore, um, you know, what we've what we've broken by giving back to our community, and I think that that's an important point. So now, now that we've examined stealing from a science perspective and and delved into it from a spiritual perspective, let's finally get down to brass tacks. How can we liberate ourselves from the strongholds of stealing? I used to think that stealing, like I said, was it was a pretty simple concept. You know, don't do it. It's bad for you. I knew that. Um, but, you know, the more I learned about it, the more I realized how complex it is and how it is just so ingrained in our society to the point where it becomes almost unavoidable. You know, I, I think that there is a lot to be empathic about here. You know, sure, most of us don't shoplift or commit burglary, but how often do we take things in our hours? You know, how often do we steal time at work? How often do we withhold income from the government? <laughs> you know, no matter where you fall on the stealing spectrum, there's something for everyone to consider because nobody, nobody is perfect when it comes to the Eighth Commandment. And so again, like, I think that there, there is a lot of opportunity for us to have empathy here. And look, I'm not here to tell anybody that they're a bad person. Clearly, I, I, I have struggled with, with, with the Eighth Commandment you know, for most of my life. I, but I think that the goal of righteousness and sanctification isn't to condemn those who fall short, um, but it's about uh, uh, us as a community recognizing that, hey, we're all better than this. We, we, we need to commit to the life that God wants for us. And, and that is the best possible version of life. And as we seek to liberate ourselves via the Eighth Commandment, here are a few questions that I'll close with that we can ask ourselves this week as we really meditate on the Eighth Commandment. The first thing I want to ask is, what are the types of stealing that we've committed, and how can we be more mindful of this? I really think mindfulness, um, as opposed to shaming ourselves for these acts, is the way to really liberate the heart, you know? And for those of us who are... are really in maybe a more dire situation you know so, uh, maybe there are people watching right now who are like me who are like perpetual um breakers of the eighth commandment 
and who, who, who regularly shoplift, who regularly steal things, you know, be honest with yourself. Do you, do you need help from a counselor? Do you need help from a pastor? Do you have a support system or a support group that you could go to that could really help you out? Uh, a study that was done at MIT shows that when people are given reminders for morality, they are less likely to, to cheat, to steal, to lie. You know, which is why they have a lot of, uh, a lot of their, not a lot, their student body, they sign an honor code as they come to school because that is a reminder for them to not cheat. That is a reminder for, for them to not steal. Um, and our reminder can be each other. Our reminder can be our community. Our reminder could be reading scripture. Our reminder together could just be meditating on the Ten Commandments, um, which is what we've been trying to do this whole series. Another question that we can ask ourselves is, how can we extend empathy and forgiveness to people who severely break the Eighth Commandment? I feel like we shame thieves so hard, but we don't recognize the humanity in what they're doing. And as these people receive the shame, all it does is it leads to more, uh, to, to more harm. They will, they will not turn away from stealing. Some will go on to steal even more things. So how can we extend empathy to these people? How can we say to these people, I see you, I, I acknowledge your struggle and I'm here for you, I'm here to help you. How can we do that as, 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 as a body of Christ? Another question, when we have the urge to steal, may, how can we exercise mindfulness and ask ourselves, what are these feelings associated with? You know, what is that feeling that I'm chasing? What is the psychological benefit of what I'm about to do? What is it about my past, perhaps, that needs to be explored or reconciled so that I can grow in this area? I know that that's not a comprehensive, a fully comprehensive list, but I think that's a good place for us to start. And I'm sure that uh, you know other questions will come up, and I and I challenge us to uh, to acknowledge those as well. It's been exactly ten years. Since I was arrested for shoplifting. I was arrested uh, for shoplifting in the summer of 2011. It's the summer of 2021 at this point and uh, wow what a journey it's been and uh, you know the shame of, uh, of it I'll be honest it still stings when I think about it it's still it still kind of hurts and I think that that will always be true but what's even more true is that I'm glad it happened. I'm glad that I went through this transformative experience where the Lord intervened, you know, in, in a moment where I was seemingly going down the wrong path. The Lord showed me mercy when I got arrested. You know, I, and from that experience, I've grown so much as a person and I now understand my true worth as a child of God. And I hope that if you're watching this, that you, that you acknowledge your true worth as well. You are so much more than your lowest moment. You can be really whatever it is that you want to be because the Lord is our Father. The Lord is our God. And we are His people. And so long as we continue to liberate ourselves and walk with God, I know that we will be content and at peace no matter our circumstances. The Lord will provide. You know, and I, and I think about myself, you know, you know, you know, 10 years removed from that and, and to this and to this day, you know, when when money gets tight, when I get the urge, I just think, wow, the Lord has granted me so much peace. And I know that he can grant you peace as well. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you forgive us for all of our sins, Lord. And you know what we struggle with on a daily basis. You know everything that happens in our life, Lord. So just be with us. Help us to not uh, succumb to the shame of our lowest moments, Lord, but to strive for our greatest life with you by our side. We know that these commandments that you've given us are the keys for us to live out our fullest and richest human lives, Lord. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.